So welcome everyone as we begin in earnest, begin um, properly our introduction to spiritual warfare. We'll begin by asking God's blessing and we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and kindle within us the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today, we're going to begin, moving on from the introduction, we're going to begin our kind of treatment of spiritual warfare. And again, just to remind you of the way that we're kind of going about doing this, this is the first of three sessions, which is going to deal with the topic of the flesh. So uh, you might remember that uh, in our Catholic tradition, uh, we have numbered rough, we have, we have numbered uh, three real enemies of God and humanity, the flesh, the world, and the devil. So by the flesh, we don't mean like our bodies or anything like that, uh, but we, what we mean really is our fallen human nature. So that's what we're going to be looking at is the first section of that fallen human nature. Uh, the way that our human nature can be inclined towards things that are going to thwart our ultimate purpose, which is union with God. So that's our ultimate purpose is union with God, but some things within our human nature that we're inclined to are... Uh, our work at cross purposes to that. That's not the way that we're created. That's a result of the fall. So another word that is used to describe our human nature, our fallen human nature's unhelpful inclinations is concupiscence. Concupiscence is another way to describe our uh, unhelpful, broken, disordered tendencies or inclinations. So in the first letter of St. John in the Bible, he identifies the threefold concupiscence, what he calls the threefold concupiscence. So these are the three ways in which our human nature is uh, fallen or inclined. He said, first is the pride of life. The second is the lust of the eyes. And the third is the lust of the flesh. Now, I'm throwing a lot of different stuff, a lot of different terminology, and I'm kind of situating us um, within this, this threefold structure. All of that is in the handout that I sent to you in that email. So if you want to pull that up uh, on your computer, it might, you might find it helpful to kind of map out where we are actually and why we're talking about what we're talking about. So again, we're looking at this overarching thing called the flesh one of the enemies of, of humanity and God. And within that, which simply just means our fallen human nature, our human nature, you could say, is fallen in three ways. The pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh. So what we're going to be looking at today is the first of those three ways. We're going to be looking at what's called the pride of life. So what is the pride of life? The pride of life is our tendency to an excessive self love. We can be inclined to love ourselves too much. So this, practically speaking, this kind of comes out in different ways. We can have an inflated sense of our own importance or our own abilities. We can think ourselves capable of judging other people and even judging God and his commandments. We can also be inclined towards uh, egotism, which is self-absorption and kind of acting out of self-interest. And then we can also uh, be excessively concerned with others' opinion of us. This is called vanity, right? So that's kind of like a, it's like a, a subsection within this larger pride of life. So again, if you want a nice little tidy definition, what is pride of life? It's our tendency to love ourselves excessively. All right. Now I'm going to pause that for one second. Okay. 
because I want this to be kind of practical and helpful for you guys and for, for me as well. So I'm going to name some of the, uh, the sins that are associated with this pride of life. I named some of them there. I named vanity, for instance, and egotism and stuff, right? But uh, I'm going to look at the very um, like well-known list of the seven deadly sins. Have you, have you come across the seven deadly sins before? And I wonder, could you name them? Okay. Um, so I'll name them for you. I won't put anybody on the spot. The seven deadly sins are pride, envy, anger, or wrath, sloth, gluttony, lust, and avarice or greed. Now, of those seven deadly sins, think to yourself for a moment, which of those seven do you think relate to the pride of life? If the pride of life is excessive self-love, loving ourselves too much or in kind of the wrong way, what might, which of those seven deadly sins might be uh, uh, kind of related to that or, or caused by that pride of life? There are three. So the first is pride, as you could probably guess, right? The second is envy. And the third is anger or wrath. So those are the three things that we're going to be practically speaking looking at today. And then next week, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at uh, three more of the seven deadly sins, which fall under the category of the lust of the flesh, which are, as you could probably imagine, sloth, gluttony, and lust. And then the third one is uh, the, the last of the seven deadly sins is greed or avarice. And that falls under the threefold concupiscence, the one of the threefold concupiscence of the lust of the eyes. Okay. And that's what we're going to be looking at two weeks from tonight. So we're going to dive right in. And again, all of that, which is kind of like a map, I would, I would describe it as like a map of the way that our human nature can be fallen. All of that is in, is on that handout. Okay. So if you're like, gosh, I'm kind of confused as to where we are on that handout, I think will be helpful and more and clarifying for you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at those three deadly sins of the seven deadly sins, which are associated with the pride of life. Okay. So we're going to look at pride, envy, and anger. We're going to look at what each of them is, how they kind of manifest our, themselves practically within our lives or the lives of other people. And then also we're going to look maybe most helpfully at how do we fight these things? How do we actually uh, root out these tendencies that we have? So the first one is pride. I think it's important to start out by saying what pride is not. Question. Is it bad to love yourself? It depends by what you mean by that, right? I think we want to uh, kind of qualify things. So is it wrong to recognize and appreciate what in ourselves is good? No, it's not wrong. It's totally legitimate. In fact, it honors God and it helps to establish self-respect. So says our tradition. Okay. Well, what about this? Is it wrong to want the respect and the esteem of other people? No, also no. When we want others to see the good that is in us so that it may give glory and honor to God, and we want to see the good in other people for the same reason, that's a perfectly valid thing. That's a great thing. Jesus says as much in the Sermon on the Mount, in fact. You might remember Jesus says this. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others. He's talking about good works so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. So it's not wrong to want the respect and esteem of others. And it's not wrong to recognize and appreciate what's good in us. But can you see how those two tendencies might become too strong in us, right? How we could... Uh, have an inflated sense of our own importance or ability or how we can be overly concerned with what other people think about us. We can 
be inclined to an excess in these in these things, right? So excessive self-love, which is pride, gives us sometimes, in some people, an inflated sense of their own importance and abilities. The word for that is presumption. So we can think so highly of ourselves that we can convince ourselves that our own judgments and our wisdom are beyond doubt. We are always right. We can also think so highly of ourselves in terms of our own goodness that we consider ourselves to be the best one to guide ourselves or to guide other people. Pride can make us blind to our own faults and how many times we stumble. And we can think so highly of ourselves that we think we don't need God or the church that he founded to guide us. Some of those things might resonate with you or you might be able to, I'm sure you'd be able to identify them in either yourself or in other people. Very common, you know, pride, this, this kind of presumption that we're talking about is very common. Another way that this kind of pride, this excessive self-love can manifest itself is in what's called ambition. So these are like the kind of uh, unhealthy examples of each of these things, right? So ambition, can ambition be healthy? Yeah, of course it can be, but it can be unhealthy as well. And this is the way in which it's unhealthy. Where excessive self-love or pride gives us a disordered, excessive love for honors or for dignities or for authority over other people where we love those things too much and we want them uh, beyond all proportion, sense of proportion. Another way which we, we talked about uh, a few minutes ago that pride or self-love can manifest itself is in a disordered or excessive desire to impress other people, to want to impress them also with all sorts of superficial things like our looks, our intelligence, our wittiness, our job, our possessions, uh, all sorts of different things. This is called vanity. Again, it's not wrong to, that, that we would want the esteem or respect of other people. That's not a bad thing at all, but we can want that too much. It can become too important to us, or we can want the admiration and approval of other people about things that are very superficial, right? And foolish. So that's called vanity. It's not wrong to recognize what's good in you or to, to um, desire others to see it or benefit from it maybe even more importantly, particularly for the right reasons, which again is to point people towards God, most especially. But you can see how we can like overestimate our own abilities or importance. We can go on an ego trip and want to impress people too much or for superficial reasons. Now, before we go on to how to fight this pride, right? Um, have you ever heard the expression that the virtue is in the mean? The virtue is in the mean. That means that the virtue, like the thing that you're aiming for, is often in between two extremes, right? So if pride is excessive self-love and the virtue is humility, which is in the middle, what's on the other extreme? Not self-love, but self-loathing, self-loathing. The inclination to utterly hate oneself and to think that you are uh, absolutely and irredeemably worthless. The virtue is in the mean, in between these two extremes, which is humility understood as not thinking uh, badly about yourself. That's not what humility is. Humility is to see yourself truly as you really are. It comes from the Latin word, which means like earth. In other words, you're like grounded. You can maybe understand it like that. 
both of those extremes, I think you can recognize in ourselves sometimes or in other people. And sometimes we sort of like, uh, we bounce back from one extreme to another, from thinking our thinking so really, really highly of ourselves to being driven almost to despair and like really hating ourselves. So how do we fight pride, this excessive self-love? How do we come closer to humility? Well, first I'm gonna give you three, three ways, three kind of categories. One is in prayer. Another is in our relationships with others. And the third is with regard to ourselves, right? So the first of all is in prayer. Prayer in and of itself is a way to fight pride. We're in the middle of Lent right now, right? And there are three main activities in Lent, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Can you see how those three activities of Lent address the threefold concupiscence? Prayer helps to make us humble. So it kind of like uh, fights against the pride of life. Fasting, fasting uh, attacks, so to speak, or goes back against the excessive love of sensual pleasure, which is the lust of the flesh. And almsgiving kind of fights, attacks, pulls back on greed or avarice, which is again, the lust of the eyes. So you can see how those three, those three things are already spiritual exercises that are built into our, our life as Catholics. We don't even, we don't realize like what they're specifically fighting, but prayer in and of itself makes us humble. And it makes sense if you think about it, because prayer is coming before almighty God in our poverty and honoring him and worshiping him as our creator and the one who has given everything to us that we need and everything in us that is good. And we, we come to him also uh, profoundly in need of him. In prayer, also examining our conscience is a really helpful tool to help to help us to grow in humility and to fight pride. And then as we grow in the spiritual life, uh, you probably remember this, those of you who were, uh, who saw the, the introduction to prayer series that we did, as we grow in the spiritual life and the life of prayer, we begin to focus more and meditate on the life of Jesus and Mary and the saints. So by meditating on Jesus particularly, but also our lady and the saints, um, we are given beautiful examples of humility. Jesus, think of Jesus in his hidden life. Think about Jesus who came to serve in his public life, in his passion. And think about Jesus in the Eucharist who makes himself so small and so humble, almighty God, that we can see him, adore him, and take him in our hands. So that's prayer. How else can we fight pride? In our relationships with others. We fight pride by acknowledging the good in others and by glorifying God for them. St. Vincent de Paul. St. Vincent de Paul said um, that we do well in our relationship with, in relationships with others to think better of others than we do ourselves. To think better of others than we do ourselves. Now, he says that this is not like a fiction. So let's say, I don't know, somebody's really, somebody's really, I don't know, not great, struggling, you know, he's a mess. Um, it's not like you're pretending like you're engaging in a fiction, like, oh, oh no, i he's really much better than I am. That's not what he's saying. He says, um, he says, imagine if that person had been given the graces that you have been given and imagine how much better they would have made use of them than you do. If you think about that, now that is a way definitely to sort of say, okay, I've been extraordinarily blessed. And if this man had been given or this person had been given what I have been given, what graces and opportunities, they would have made much better use of it than I have. And we can say that very clearly because often we, we don't make great use of the graces that God gives us. So it's not about engaging in like fiction, pretending. It's about really saying no, to think better of other people or to think that they would have made a better job of 
of the graces that we've uh, squandered. In our relationships with others, two very other practical points, apologizing when you need to, and really apologizing. Not the sort of fake apology that uh, is laden with excuses, <laughs> right? But really apologizing. When we were in seminary, we had to learn this and uh, we had to learn it and, and practice it in a way that was very um, unnatural at first. So if you messed up in seminary, right? And if you let, let, a, let a brother down in some way, you would go up to him and you'd say, um, I apologize for this. And he would say, apology accepted. <laughs> he didn't say, all right, no, don't worry about it. You're grand. You're fine. Ah, sure. Not at all. You know, it was like, no, I'm telling you, I messed up. I apologize. And he would, by accepting your apology, forgive you. And then it was done. But we can, I don't know if you've, you've felt this inclination, this tendency within you to excuse yourself and to cushion an apology that you do make uh, so that you don't come across as guilty, you know? So apologizing and doing it kind of in a straightforward way is a really good way to grow in humility. And then asking for help when you need to. Again, this is like so hard for some people to ask for help from the people around us that God has given to us. Okay. And last, with regard to ourselves, how do we grow in humility, grow away from kind of fight pride? Uh, some self-denial is a good thing. So are you inclined to look for the spotlight? Are you inclined to, to like the attention or the approval too much? Look for hidden ways to serve that no one is going to notice. Look for the humblest and most hidden things that you can do and then do those things. Also, if you find yourself inclined to dominate conversations, to talk a lot, uh, in conversations, ask more questions, listen more, be interested in the other person and treat them as though they were more important and don't dominate the conversation. Are you inclined to give advice too freely? Do you have an answer for everyone's problem? And do you think yourself like a, some sort of a guru? <laughs> uh, make a habit of listening to the counsel of Christ above all and the church that he founded and the advice of those who are wiser and holier than you. Seek wisdom from other people. So those are some self-denial things. Okay. Now, envy and, envy and anger are the next two that we're going to look at, and they're quite a bit shorter, okay? So what is envy? Envy is the tendency to be saddened by something good that happens to somebody else or something that someone else has, as if we are made less by their goodness. So I'm going to say that again. Envy is the tendency to be sad when good things happen to other people or good things that they have themselves as though we are made less or diminished by their goodness. It's often coupled with a desire to see somebody deprived or lose whatever good that we're talking about. Now, it's linked with pride. You can probably see this because pride can't stand a rival or someone who is superior to them. To be proud is to be convinced of our own superiority. And so we can be sad when others are better gifted than we are. What kind of things might we envy in other people? We can envy anything good that happens to them from getting a job promotion to a new relationship, to praise that they receive or we can envy something that they have, or even like a good quality or a virtue. We can envy that in other people. 
The most serious kind of envy is spiritual envy because it's the greatest good that someone can have. Now, envy is different from jealousy. Jealousy and envy are often um, kind of uh, thought to be synonymous, basically, right? But envy is actually different. How is it different? Jealousy is an excessive love of what is ours and a fear that someone's going to take it away from us. Envy, on the other hand, is sadness as, at what is someone else's. So jealousy is an excessive love of what we have and a fear that someone's going to take it away from us. Envy is sadness at what someone else has. How do you fight envy? When you first, this is again from our tradition, this is not just my advice, okay? These are the, this is the wisdom of the saints and also the wisdom of like our church and our wonderful Catholic tradition. So fighting envy. When you first sense that sadness at something good in someone else, stamp it out. When the temptation arises, say no to it strongly. Don't kind of indulge it or excuse it or whatever. Like really be firm. No, nope. I am not going to let this make me sad. If it's really strong, that inclination, that kind of like, oh, that sadness, you know, that, that envy. If it's really sad, you can, the, the advice is to distract your mind, to turn your mind towards something else. And when the strength of that sort of like the, the passion of envy when that strength has gone out of that impulse, you can calmly then remember that a good quality that someone else has doesn't diminish us at all. It's simply something good that they have. It doesn't mean that we're less or take anything away from us. The third way to fight envy is to honor and praise Jesus in the blessed sacrament. That's especially, that's specifically named in our tradition. So I, I'm giving it to you as well to honor and praise Jesus in the blessed sacrament as the giver of all good gifts and to thank him for the gifts that you see in others. So if you're inclined to envy someone, some good thing to turn to God in prayer and to thank and praise God for his goodness that you can see blessing someone else. And the fourth way to fight envy is by emulation, emulation. So envy is very different from emulation. Emulation is a praiseworthy desire to imitate or to equal or even to surpass in some good quality another person. Now, this is a very good thing to emulate them, to strive to equal them in some quality or even to surpass them. It's good provided that, right? First, we admire the right things about them, not things that are kind of very superficial, right? But something that's authentically and substantially good, something of character. Secondly, that our motivation isn't to be better than them or to best them, but rather to better ourselves and to give glory to God. And then also, obviously, like as we strive, we can't like cut the legs out from other, other people, you know, like we have to go about it in like a, a way that's, that's fair and that's right. So emulation, it's almost like using that, that uh, disordered uh, passion of sadness at someone else's good. It's almost using that energy uh, in a way that is constructive, you know, to say, I see this good thing in someone else and they're better at it than I am, or they have it more than I do. Rather than begrudge them that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to admire it and say, I want to be more like them. That's what I want to be like. But again, think of your own experience of sadness or of envy of that sadness at seeing the good in someone else. That we've got to fight. Okay, the last one that we're going to look at is anger. So when we're talking about anger, right? 
there is a difference between healthy anger and anger as like one of the seven deadly sins, right? We're not talking about the feeling of anger here, uh, but about the sin of anger. What's the difference? Well, everyone gets angry sometimes, right? But not everyone has an unhealthy tendency to excessive unhealthy anger. That's what we're talking about. What does healthy anger look like? The tradition gives us three characteristics of healthy anger. Healthy anger means we are angry for a good reason. I.e. that there's something wrong. Something's not what it should be. Or someone has done something wrong that they shouldn't have done. But that there's a good reason for it. We're not just sort of, we're not angry for no reason or angry for the wrong reasons. Number two, healthy anger. An anger that's healthy is moderate and it's in proportion to whatever wrong has been done. So we're not as angry with some situations as we are with other situations. The more serious the situation, the more, uh, the more kind of angry you might be. But if you kind of like uh, lose control entirely, you sort of blow a gasket at something really small, you can see that's excessive anger. And last, the third kind of characteristic of healthy anger is that anger is directed towards charity. Where it's directed towards making things right. The righting of a wrong. And it doesn't descend into revenge or hatred. So those are the ways that anger is healthy. And all of those have to be present for our, our uh, natural inclination to, to anger, for anger, to be healthy. It's not a sin to be angry just in and of itself, but it can be a sin to be angry for the wrong reasons or at the wrong people, or to be angry in a way that we blow it all out of proportion, right? Or where we let anger descend into resentment or hatred and in, 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 um, an inclination to seek revenge. Unhealthy anger has one of those three characteristics, okay? And again, what we're talking about here is like, uh, not like one manifestation, one episode of anger. Like, you know, it happens sometimes that, you know, somebody you blow up or you get angry at somebody and you, uh, upon reflection, you see, you know, they really didn't do anything wrong. They just told me the truth about myself or something, right? Um, what we're talking about here is not one kind of episode of anger, but a inclination, like a stable inclination that people have. Some people have an inclination to excessive, unreasonable anger. How do we fight that? So the tradition encourages us uh, in a very human way, and it's really beautiful, in a really human way to make sure that our diet is good and that we're exercising, <laughs> which is really very human if you think about it. It's like, yeah, you know, if I'm not the best, if I'm not doing great physically, well, then I'm going to be inclined to be irritable <laughs> or, you know, like, uh, yeah, to lack patience, right? Um, another thing that we do to fight anger is uh, to acquire the habit of reflecting before acting or speaking, to grow in the habit of reflecting before we act or speak. Now, this has been described, again, very humanly and very with great understanding and compassion as uphill work. <laughs> this is hard, okay? But don't be discouraged, right? If this is an inclination that you have, if you find it very hard, uh, press on, keep going, and try to cultivate more and more that reflection before you act or before you speak. Third, don't spend time mulling over wrongs done to you by people. 
Don't spend time dwelling on what people have done to you in the past. What are you doing? You're adding fuel to the fire of outrage and resentment. Okay, well, what if these thoughts come up? They just sort of arise unconsciously. It's not like we, we conjure them, them up very often. Often they just kind of like pop into our heads and we start to dwell on them and we just get more and more irate. What happens when those thoughts just pop into our minds? Well, again, the advice of our tradition, spiritual tradition, is to turn your mind towards something else. You don't just sort of like uh, will with all your strength that those thoughts to disappear from your mind. No, you just turn your mind towards something else. I was talking to a man recently who really struggled with anger for years, really struggled with anger. And he told me, he said, do you know, he said, I have, uh, I've seen a real change in myself. And I was like, oh, great. I was like, I'm so glad to hear that. And he said, uh, do you know what's helped me? I said, no, what? He goes, whenever I find myself like, you know, that surge of anger that can kind of like well up within us. Whenever he says, I feel that happening and I catch myself, he says, I say the Hail Mary slowly and kind of deliberately. He just says the Hail Mary. And by the end of the Hail Mary, that surge has dissipated and it's not nearly as strong as it was. That's obviously beautiful for two reasons. Number one is you're asking for Our Lady's help, right? When you're praying to help you to be patient and not to be uh, angry in a way that's unhealthy, but also you're distracting your mind in a really human way. You're turning your mind in, of, instead of whatever wrong or slight you've experienced, you're instead turning your mind towards something else. And that actually helps you get you through that initial surge of that passion, that impulse. It gets you through that. And unsurprisingly, uh, the tradition also counsels prayer for us, right? Um, so meditating particularly on Jesus's patience and his mercy, even to those who wronged him. There was no one as innocent as Christ, and there was no one who was as unjustly treated as him. And it helps us to turn towards him and his life and to say, Lord, help me to be more like that, to admire that in him and to want to be more like that. And then remember our own need to forgive and pray the Our Father. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Anger is... Uh, Anger is also, well, no, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, those are the ways, some of the ways to fight anger. What we've been looking at today is what's called the, you know, within this, uh, the way in which our human nature is broken or, uh, yeah, the, the way that our human nature is in some way disordered. And we've been looking at, of that threefold concupiscence, the pride of life, and looking at three of the ways that that pride of life, that excessive self-love can manifest itself in pride, in envy, and in anger. And looking also then at some of the ways that we can combat that and come to the virtues. So the virtue opposed to pride, as you see on your hand out there, is humility. We talked about that. The virtue opposed to envy is kindness. If, the, if envy is sadness at the good of someone else, kindness is to look at the good that happens to other people and to be glad for them, to be happy when good things happen to other people. And then anger, the vice of anger, this excessive uh, inclination to revenge or to, uh, you know, like violent uh, getting our own is patience, patience. So we've looked at how we can fight those vices 
and grow in those virtues. Now, does anyone have any questions there? Okay. Individualism that I've often heard referred to as the cult of the individual. Can you reflect on how maybe excessive self-love is promoted? Seems to be most prevalent in new age writings. Mm. Yeah, we live in one of the defining characteristics of modernity and uh, sort of like the, yeah, the, the air that we breathe is uh, freedom is one of its greatest values which isn't a bad thing, but it's the way that our culture society looks at freedom is as uh, autonomy. No one gets to tell me what to do. I get to do what I want to do. And I am the author of my own life, of who I am, even down to like my very nature, let's say. And there's a decided uh, lack of... Um, humility or ability to accept that, no, well, you know, I depend on other people and I depend ultimately on God. And so much of who I am and what I am is given to me. And I am not entirely, totally autonomous. Um, there's a sort of the, the humility thing, let's say, um, is a, yeah, is, is kind of lacking, like real authentic humility and uh, a willingness to accept being like a creature and being flawed. Um, yeah. So autonomy is a big kind of emphasis in the world that we live in, in post-modernity, it's called, and individualism big time as well. Um, how is can you reflect on how maybe excessive self-love is promoted? Hmm. Well, I think it's kind of, I don't know. I think it's sort of, uh, what's the word? I think there's a lot of lip service paid to um, like two people and to like that excessive self-love. So for example, you know, like, uh, you know, nobody, nobody can tell you what to do, uh, sort of break free from all of the, uh, the influences and the things that can control you, uh, be a free thinker, make your own decisions, etc. That's, that's definitely a lot of the kind of messaging. And a lot of that's not bad, but at the same time, like, you'll find that in our, in the world that we live in, if you don't think like the majority of people think, then often you're kind of pilloried or excluded or canceled <laughs> or whatever, you know? So there's sort of uh, I don't know, there's like a, a, there's not a logical consistency, I think in, um, in, in the world that we live in. I think that you know, like autonomy and, um, you know, are that, that inclination to be, uh, to think ourselves like totally wise and the authors of our own existence, et cetera. I think even that has limits and, um, you know, people are very uh, often quite intolerant uh, as well. If the views that people have, their, their values, they don't match up with, with theirs. Um, and then self-love in new age writings. To be honest with you, I, I'd have to plead ignorance about that. I, I would, have, th those of you who have um, had brushes with the new age or maybe dabbled in it or whatever, you're probably much better able to, to articulate that than, than I would be. Um, yeah. I've got lots of uh, like, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grade A sinner. I feel like I'm well qualified to talk about all these things, but uh, the new age, thankfully was not something that I ever really kind of drifted into lots of other things, mind you, just not that. <laughs> um, it would be a great topic to teach in secondary schools. So beneficial for later in life. Very helpful. Very good. The world is teaching us that humility is a bad thing. 
We should be the best we can be and never mind anybody else as if we are the center of the universe. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a, a fair assessment and yeah, humility definitely is um, it's not, it's not held up as like a great uh, something to aspire to. Yeah. I think that it's because again, people have the wrong idea about humility. Um, people think to be humble means to think that you're basically worthless and irredeemable and you just think bad thoughts about yourself like all the time. Well, that's not humility. You know, that's like, I don't know. I don't know what you are, but you're not humble if you're doing that, right? But humility is, is to see yourself truly. And uh, yeah, but when you see yourself truly, you see the bad and the flaws as well as the good. And you uh, are able to acknowledge that like, okay, these are areas that I need to grow in. I'm not perfect. I need to repent and to learn from other people. I got a lot to learn. Uh, I don't have all the answers and I'm not God's gift to humanity, you know, but yeah. Uh, but I think you can see also how we flit between the two. I've known lots of, I get to work with young people a bit and I've known some young people who have really struggled with self-loathing and then others who have, who struggle. And again, I think it's, it's not an either, or I think we can flit from one to the other, but from an excessive self-love as well. So I think both are, are kind of there and we want to aim for humility, which is there's peace in humility, you know, um, there's real, there's, uh, it's liberating to be able to say, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Or that's, no, that's, I never thought of that. Uh, let me go and think about that. Or let me go and, and look that up. And now hey, you gave me something to think about there. You know, I don't know. It's, uh, it's great not to have to pretend like you're perfect or have all the answers. To be humble is to be able to acknowledge our limitations. Well, uh, thanks very much, everybody. And uh, we'll finish with a prayer. And then again, next week, what we're going to look at is the lust of the flesh, right? Or are we going to do the lust of the eyes next week? I think we're going to do the lust of the... I think we're going to do the lust of the flesh next week. Yeah, I think we're going to do the lust of the flesh, which is sloth, gluttony, and lust. And then we'll look at the lust of the eyes for the last session. Okay. So we'll finish with the prayer now in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. Amen. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for the great gift of the scripture where you teach us who you are and who we are truly. Thank you for the gift of the church that you established who guides us and who teaches us and who helps us to grow closer to you. And thank you for the saints. Thank you for the men and women of heroic faith and who are heroic in the virtues who teach us what it really looks like to, to live well. We pray glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks very much. See you next week.